Thank you for taking the time to watch our training video. This training video will provide a complete overview on best practices for recording ABRs using the IHS SmartDP system. We will begin with the testing area and the equipment setup, then cover the settings and parameters, the patient setup and electrode montage. After an overview of the SmartDP software interface, we will show you how to acquire and analyze recordings and finish with report generation. The American Academy of Audiology Practice Guidelines Assessment of Hearing in Infants and Young Children from January 2020 emphasized that the testing area for ABR assessment must be a quiet room or sound-treated booth, and that if performed with sedation or anesthesia, the surgery center, a procedure room, or operating room are permissible. The IHS Duet Smart EP has been used successfully by our customers to record ABRs in all these settings. It is important that when using a cart, that the Duet be connected to an isolation transformer and that the cart be grounded. The Academy guidelines state that the space and power supply must be free of excessive electrical noise and that the space should include a crib or secure area for the infant. Proper ground connections are crucial for ABR recordings. When setting up the testing area, it is important that the equipment be grounded, connected to an earth ground. Any metal surface must also be grounded. For more details on reducing electrical interference, I invite you to watch our companion video on the subject. The Academy guidelines calls for, and I quote, FDA-approved auditory evoke potential computer with insert earphones, supraoral earphones, and bone oscillator. Two-channel capability is advisable, but not necessary. The Duet is an FDA-cleared two-channel auditory evoke potential device. We also offer the option to use it as a one-channel device for ABR testing with automatic switching of the polarity for the customers who prefer using only three electrodes when testing infants. It can be used with any Windows 10 PC, such as a laptop shown on the screen. You will see also the back view of the Duet on the right, showing all the connectors that are clearly labeled. We offer two types of two-channel electrode cables. On the left is a Duet 5 electrode lead, to which snap leads, reusable gold or silver cup electrodes, or leaded electrodes can be connected. This cable has five inputs, two negative inputs and two positive inputs, as well as a ground input in black. The negative or inverting input for the right channel is red and the positive or non-inverting is white. The negative or inverting input for the left channel is blue and its positive non-inverting input is gray. The two positive or non-inverting inputs can be joined together using a Y adapter or jumper cable. Please remember to always keep your electrode leads braided to minimize noise contaminants. The Duet 4 snap lead cable is intended to be used with disposable snap electrodes and has two negative or inverting connections, one red and one blue, a ground connection in black, and one positive or non-inverting. The white snap, since two positive connections are joined internally. The one channel electrode cables have three inputs. The white is always positive or non inverting. The ground and negative or inverting polarity switch from the red and the blue position depending on which ear is stimulated. You can use the snap lead, reusable gold or silver cup electrodes, leaded electrodes with the three electrode lead cable and only disposable snap electrodes with the snap lead cable pictured on the right. The Academy guidelines state that the transducer of choice for pediatric assessment using ABR is an insert earphone for air conduction testing and a standard clinical bone oscillator for bone conduction testing. For testing of children with ear canal stenosis or atresia, supraoral earphones will be necessary. We offer ER3 insert earphones, supraoral headphones, and a bone oscillator. We use 300 ohm ER3C insert earphones with the Duet, which you can see on the left. 
On the right, you will see the ER38 inserted earphones. The beige pediatric foam tips or plastic infant ear tips can be attached to the flexible tubing. Most new Duet devices ship with the newer Radio Ear B81 bone oscillator pictured on the left. The Radio Ear 300 ohm B71 bone conductor, which was supplied until the release of the B81, can also be used. Since both models have different calibration tables, please be sure to select the correct transducer in the software. If you are interested in using the B81, but have the B71, please contact the technical support team to ensure compatibility with your device. In the past, we supplied the TDH49 300 home headphones pictured on the right. As this model is being discontinued by Telefonics, we now offer the Radio Ear DD45 pictured on the left. The supplies you will need include electrodes, either disposable or those that can be disinfected, skin preparation gels, alcohol prep pads, electrode conduction creams or pastes, surgical tape, gauze squares, variety of single-use or disinfectable earphone tips, and otoscope and specula. The practice guidelines of the American Academy of Audiology Assessment of Hearing in Infant and Young Children state that disposable electrodes are recommended for infection control. IHS has validated the equipment with the AMBU Neuroline disposable electrodes and recommends these electrodes. Please be sure that your disposable snap electrodes are kept in an airtight sealed bag, that they are less than a year old and not expired. The electrodes are pre-gelled and should not be dry before you start using them. Fresh electrodes will have gel on the center sponge. Reusable gold cup electrodes as well as clip electrodes can also be used. Please be sure these are clean and not tarnished. Electrode prep creams such as new prep or electrode prep pads can be used to prepare the skin for electrode application. For centers that are required to use single-use items for skin preparation, we highly recommend the electrode prep pads pictured here. More than an alcohol pad, these pads have pumice, which helps reduce impedance. 1020 conductive paste can also be used with reusable electrodes. EEG conductive gel, such as a spectra gel, can be added to the disposable electrodes to improve conductivity. For pediatric assessment, we offer a variety of sizes of single-use earphone tips. The 3.5 and 4 mm plastic infant ear tips can be used for smaller ear canals. The beige pediatric foam ear tips are also widely used in pediatric clinics. Electrophysiologic evoked potential evaluation, such as a tone burst ABR, can be used to determine the presence and type of hearing loss in newborns and infants, a child of any age who is incapable of providing accurate information for behavioral tests, or who has yielded behavioral test results that are not reliable or are incomplete. ABRs can be evoked using click and tone bursts. Click ABR is used for neurological auditory neural synchrony assessments, such as in the diagnosis of auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder. Click stimuli do not provide frequency-specific information and should not be substituted for tone bursts for diagnostic audiometric purposes. Tone burst ABRs are used in threshold assessments. These are evoked using short duration tones of six millisecond durations called tone bursts or PIPs with frequencies from 500 Hertz to 4000 Hertz with a Blackman window function. The American Academy of Audiology Practice Guidelines Assessment of Hearing in Infants and Young Children from January 2020 state that the purpose of tone burst ABR is to determine the presence and type of hearing levels for individual frequencies in each ear. The parameters are stored in the SmartDP software as settings file. Sample settings files are provided with the machine and can be loaded via the Load Settings option in SmartDP, which we'll review later in the video. We will use a 5 millisecond duration for the 500 and 1000 Hz tones, 
a 2.5 millisecond duration for the 1000 Hz tone, and a 1.25 millisecond duration for the 4000 Hz tone. The Academy Practice Guidelines recommended stimulus rate is between 27 to 39 per second. For example, 27.7 or 39.7 per second. We use an alternating polarity for the tone burst. For the clicks, we would be alternating the polarity, which will help to distinguish portions of the response that are neural and those that are cochlear, such as the cochlear microphonic. The preneural cochlear response, or the cochlear microphonic, will change polarity along with the stimulus, while the neural response, or the ABR, does not. For the tone burst, standard threshold search procedures should be employed, starting at 50 or 60 dB NHL. If a clear response is seen, decrease the intensity in 20 dB steps using an up 10 dB, down 20 dB bracketing procedure to determine threshold. Threshold determination below 15 to 20 dB HL is generally not necessary. It is also reasonable for experienced clinicians to begin testing at screening levels, such as 35 to 40 dB, in order to quickly identify normal and near normal thresholds. If a response is not clearly observable, increase the intensity by 20 dB steps until clearly observed and continue the bracketing procedure. Unless otherwise indicated, testing should start with a high frequency, for example, 2000 Hz, in one and then the opposite ear, followed by a low frequency, 500 Hz. It is valuable to alternate ears if possible to have information on both if the child wakes up before the test is complete. Recording bandwidth is from 30 to 1500 Hz for the infant ABR settings. The high pass filter should be 30 to 50 Hz if possible, or 100 Hz only if noise does not permit use of a lower frequency, typically in older children and adults where EMG noise is present. The low pass filter is set to 1500 Hz. The amplifier gain is set to 100,000 amplification. The notch filter, 60 or 50 Hz depending on where you're located, is turned off, but can be activated to reduce line noise when needed. Sweeps are the sample size or number of repetitions. The more you average, the more likely you will eliminate noise and increase response clarity. Commonly used sweep counts include 1,024 and 2,048 for ABR. The Academy guidelines state that the protocol should be set by default to at least 6,000 sweeps and stopped manually when a clear response is detected. A minimum of 1,000 sweeps is always needed to ensure a stable response. Reliability can be evaluated by repeating an average at least once or by the use of valid response detection criteria, such as the FSP. At threshold, or if a child is noisy, more sweeps, 4,000 to 6,000 or more, may be necessary to achieve a quality response in which the waveform is clear. Under sedation, fewer sweeps should be necessary in general. Given time limitations, response repetition can be used only as necessary to clarify presence or absence of a response. The recording analysis window should be a minimum of 20 milliseconds and is set to 25.6 milliseconds in our settings files. If there is no ABR response to 2000 Hz by air conduction at the limits of the equipment, or if all ASSR thresholds are not within normal limits, an assessment for auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder, or ANSD, should be initiated. Here are the parameters for the click ABR settings. ABRs are recorded using a high-level 80 dB NHL 100 microsecond click stimulus in each of the two single polarities, rarefaction and condensation, at a rate of 27 to 39 per second, for example, 27.7 or 39.7 per second for each year. The recording bandwidth is again from 30 to 1500 hertz for the infant click ABR settings. The amplifier is set to 100 times amplification. 
The notch filter, 60 or 50 Hz depending on where you're located, is turned off, but can be activated to reduce line noise when needed. 1,000 sweeps will be recorded for each polarity. The responses will be plotted on top of each other to inspect for the cochlear microphonic. The recording analysis window is set to 12.8 milliseconds. Patient preparation is an important factor in optimizing the conditions for recording ABRs. From the American Academy of Audiology Practice Guidelines, Assessment of Hearing in Infants and Young Children Sedation and Patient Preparation section states, more than any other audiologic test, it is imperative that children sleep soundly for a prolonged period of time to obtain clean, low-noise electrophysiologic recordings. Natural sleep is best, but when this cannot be assured, sedation is necessary. Patients must be managed appropriately prior to their appointments to facilitate a quietly sleeping child. When testing children in natural sleep, it is important to develop a protocol for parents that includes depriving the child of sleep prior to the test, including time and transit, and often involves bringing children to the appointment hungry and asking the parent to feed the child after the electro preparation to help induce sleep. It is not uncommon for a complete electrophysiologic evaluation to be conducted in two or more test sessions. It is advisable to prepare the parents for that possibility when scheduling the initial appointment. Most of the pediatric clinics using the IHS duet with SmartEP perform ABRs in the clinic with natural sleep and no sedation. Make sure the skin is clean. Skin that is too dry, too oily, or flaky may affect impedance. Prepare the skin for electrode application with new prep or an electrode prep pad. Carefully clean and mildly abrade the skin using small circles in the locations where you'll be placing the electrodes. The electrodes are pretty gelled and should not be dry before you start using them. To obtain the most ideal impedance, especially on delicate skin that cannot be abraded, IHS recommends the use of spectrogel in addition to the gel already on the electrode. Place a small drop of spectrogel on a gauze pad. You can also use the backing of the electrode. Use a small dab of spectrogel in the center of the electrode sponge. You can proceed with placing the electrode without adding extra gel. When placing the electrode, press down around the sponge to secure the electrode in place. Do not press in the center of the electrode as this can spread the gel and make the electrode come loose. Electrode placement is as follows. The electrode connected to the positive, non-inverting connection on the amplifier should be at midline, preferably vertex, CZ, or high forehead, FPZ. The negative, inverting electrodes should be applied to the mastoids or earlobes. Earlobe electrodes will minimize interference when testing by bone conduction. When recording in dual channel mode using the five electrode lead cable, the two positive, non-inverting inputs are joined together using a Y adapter or jumper cable. The electrode connected to the red input will be placed on the right earlobe or mastoid, and the electrode connected to the blue input will be placed on the left earlobe or mastoid. The ground electrode will be placed on the low forehead. In the amplifier settings window of the software, channel A, which is the red input on the cable, will have a channel designation as right, and channel B, which is the blue input on the cable, will have a channel designation as left. When recording in single channel mode using the three lead one channel cable, the red electrode will be placed on the right mastoid or earlobe and the blue electrode lead will be placed on the left mastoid or earlobe. The negative and ground will switch from the right to the left ear and the white electrode will remain the positive non-inverting connection which will be placed at midline, preferably vertex CZ or high forehead FPZ. In the amplifier settings window of the software, only channel A will be active. The channel designation should be set to right-left, which will activate the automatic polarity switching from the negative to the ground. This means that when you are testing the left ear, the electrode connected to the left ear and blue input will be negative, and the one connected to the right ear and red input will be the ground. When you are testing the right ear, the electrode connected to the right ear and red input will be negative, 
and the one connected to the left ear and black input will be ground. The white input will always remain positive or non-inverting electrode and should be placed at midline, preferably vertex CZ or high forehead FBZ. When recording in single channel mode using the five electrode lead cable, the red electrode will be placed on the right mastoid or earlobe and the electrode connected to the black input will be placed on the left mastoid or earlobe. The negative and ground will switch from the right to the left ear, and the white electrode will be made the positive, non-inverting connection which will be placed at midline, preferably vertex CZ or high forehead FPZ. In the amplifier settings window of the software, only channel A will be active. The channel designation should be set to right-left which will activate the automatic polarity switching from the negative to the ground. This means that when you are testing the left ear, the electrode connected to the left ear and black input will be negative, and the one connected to the right ear and red input will be the ground. When you are testing the right ear, the electrode connected to the right ear and red input will be negative, and the one connected to the left ear and black input will be ground. The white input will always remain in the positive or non-inverting electrode and should be placed at midline, preferably vertex CZ or high forehead FPZ. The electrode impedance should be no more than 5 kilo ohms between any electrode pair and should be matched across pairs within 1 kilo ohms. The impedance at each position should be lower than 7 kilo ohms. Once electrodes are in place, Ensure that the child is comfortable, dry, fed, and attempt to induce sleep. It is important to place the electrodes first to improve the impedance and therefore our signal quality. The amplitude of ABR responses range from about 0.1 to 1 microvolt. ABRs are extracted from EEG background noise in the range of 10 to 100 microvolts. The Duet's amplifier design allows us to record cleaner, more robust responses with increased signal-to-noise ratio and low residual noise. But to optimize our recording quality and make sure we can acquire the best possible recordings, it is important to make sure our equipment and patient are set up properly and that our testing area and conditions are optimal. I will share with you a few quick tips that we have found help reduce interference and optimize testing conditions. First and foremost, make sure you have a grounded connection. Ensure that all system components are on and connected properly. Components should always be away from electrical devices. If there are any other devices that are connected to the same electrical outlet or circuit, make sure to disconnect any other device that does not have ground connections. I have personally visited some clinics experiencing noisy recordings on their ABR equipment, and upon disconnecting other devices like an LED lamp or a hearing aid charger with power cables that did not have ground connections from the power strip, or another outlet maybe that shared the same electrical circuit, that completely eliminated the noise. Ungrounded devices, those with two-prong connectors as shown on the left, can be an avoidable source of noise. Make sure all devices connected to the same power sources at the right, including your computer, have three-prong grounded connectors as shown in the green circle. Avoid placing the equipment on metal surfaces. If using a cart with metal components, make sure the cart is grounded. Some additional tips include separating cables from each other, Avoid having the transducers touching the patient cable. One way to do this is to have the insert earphones coming from the top of the bed, chair, or car seat, and the electrode cable coming from the bottom. If the mother is holding the baby, the mother should avoid touching the electrode cable. Make sure your electrode lead cables are not older than a year and are braided, that your electrodes are not expired and conductive, and that you're using the correct montage. Also, make sure the impedance is low and balanced. If necessary, move the electrode cable around until you locate a low noise location in the patient's testing setup area. The EEG signal shown on the EEG and amplifier settings window 
and in the EEG viewing panel should not appear to be cyclical or repeatable in nature and should have a very small amplitude. Activating the line filter will help reduce the effect of 60 Hz or 50 Hz line noise as shown on the screen below. This should only be done if environmental noise cannot be eliminated. On the left side, you'll see an example of the EEG of a patient in a calm and optimal state where the incoming EEG signals are small in amplitude and within the artifact acceptance region. The example on the right is for the EEG of a patient in a very active, poor state. The EEG signals are also within the red shaded area, which means they're going to be rejected. Now, we will switch gear and launch the SmartEP software for an overview of the SmartEP software interface. This is a SmartEP software program. Below the streamlined menus in the user-friendly interface of SmartEP, you will find large accessible buttons on the toolbar that provide easy access to the most commonly used functions. As you hover over each button, a description of its function will be displayed. We will go through each button later on in the training. At the bottom of the screen, you will find a simplified control panel. This panel provides direct main screen access to change any parameter. To quickly begin a test, you can click on Load Settings and choose from a list of pre-configured test protocols. You can also easily modify any parameter right from the control panel without needing to go into submenus or other windows. For parameters with set options, simply click on the item to toggle through the available options. For example, with a single click on the ear button, I can change from left to right or both ears. You can switch the polarity of the stimulus with a single click, going from rarefaction to condensation or alternating. For other parameters, you can double click to enter specific values. To change the number of sweeps, double click and enter a value. And the same can be done for the rate. Right clicks and left clicks will also allow you to modify the values. A right click on intensity will increase the intensity by 10, and a left click brings it down by 10, or the step size selected in the software. And you may also double click on intensity to enter a specific value. A single click on Stim will open the Stimulus Generation Utility. The Amplifier button on the right side of the screen opens the Amplifier Settings window where you can modify the amplifier settings, such as the Gain, High Pass, and Low Pass, and activate the Line Filter. The recordings will appear in the large white space. You can choose to activate or hide a low profile grid on the page by clicking on the set page button or on the page number, which can be found on the right of the white space. Clicking on each page, you will also be able to customize page attributes such as a scale, page name, and much more. The ACQ page is the acquisition page from which you will always be recording. The page settings for the acquisition page are saved in the settings files, including the sample settings we provide. We provide a set of pediatric audiology page labels, which I will load up and save as my default. Now, you will notice that the page names have changed. We will talk about the other pages when we discuss report generation later in the video. Right below the menus, you will find a toolbar with various shortcut icons for easy access to often used features. Later in the video, during the recording acquisition section, we will go into more detail on the function of each icon. 
shortcuts to create and access patient records, label recordings, load and save recordings, applying filters, arranging recordings, save and printing recordings, adding notes, and the user's manual. I would like to thank the team at Boston Children's Hospital for providing us with real-life de-identified data from their records, which were instrumental in being able to show you how to acquire using our equipment. So, let's begin recording. First, I will create a new patient file by clicking on the new patient icon on the top left and entering the patient's information. You can enter as much or as little information on your patient as you want beyond the first and last name fields, which are required. If you wish to enter a medical record number, please enter it in the main ID field. The EEG button on the right side of the screen opens a viewing panel for the incoming EEG. This panel can be displayed or hidden at any time. Before beginning acquisition, the impedance can be checked on the screen. The value for each electrode as well as the time the impedance is checked is displayed. The blue line represents the incoming EEG, and the red shaded area is the artifact rejection region. When the blue line goes into the red area, the sweeps will be rejected. And when it stays in the white area, the sweeps will be accepted. Now, I'll click on Load Settings and select my ClickABR settings file, and I'm ready to begin. I set my intensity to 80 and click on Acquire. To select a waveform, you can click on the waveform or on the circle on the left of the waveform. Once a waveform is selected, you can move it up and down the screen by dragging it or by using the up and down arrow keys on the keyboard. During acquisition, the number of sweeps will appear on the top left with the number of rejections next to it. You can label the peaks at any time during or after acquisition and even work on one waveform while acquiring another. While I'm working to label one recording, I'll begin acquisition for my left ear so I can multitask. To mark the peaks, first make sure the waveform you're trying to label is selected. The selected waveforms are green in color. Click on the label for the peak you're trying to mark, and then click right above or below the waveform where you would like to place it. Once the peak label is placed, you will notice there are two triangles, one at the top facing down and one at the bottom facing up. The top marker is the latency marker, and the bottom marker is the amplitude marker. You can adjust the position of either marker either by clicking and dragging the marker or using the keyboard. To move the latency marker, use the right and left arrow keys. And to move the amplitude marker, use the right or left arrow keys while holding down the Alt key. I'm going to repeat the recordings, and while it's recording, I'm going to click on the Rec Info button on the right side of the screen to open up the Embedded Recording Information panel. This panel provides easy access to very useful information about each recording. You can choose to keep it open at all times or use it as needed. I can select one recording either by clicking on the recording as we did earlier or by selecting a recording from the drop-down menu on the panel. When you have many recordings on the screen, you can also use the S key on your keyboard as a shortcut to cycle through the recordings. Once a recording is selected, and if you have labeled your peaks, the peak information appears in the peak tab of the panel. Here, you will find a latency and amplitude of each labeled peak, as well as the interpeak latencies. Switch to the Response tab to find more information about the quality of the recording. Along with the signal-to-noise ratio, SNR, and residual noise levels, RN, we also provide a cross-correlation indication of repeatability of the response within itself based on the calculation region. FSP and FMP values can be calculated when recording in blocks. This can be activated in the Averaging menu. As I continue recording, and I've switched the polarity to condensation, 
I want to draw your attention to the right side of the screen as we discuss some of the display features. You can easily zoom the recordings in and out using the zoom buttons, plus zooms in and minus zooms out. A horizontal baseline can also be shown for each recording, and this can be activated from the show menu. Another display option you may find useful is the ability to show the latency and amplitude of a recording right on the waveform. For those of you who look for the cochlear microphonic, you may find it useful to set your display to start from negative two millisecond. You can change the display time window from the set page menu or by right clicking on your page. Since I have multiple recordings with the same parameters on the page, I will take the opportunity to walk you through adding two recordings. First, select the recordings you want to add by clicking on one, holding down the control key, and selecting the other. You will notice that both of the circles on the left of the recordings are filled, meaning they are both selected. To create a grand average or add both, you can either go to the process menu and then add selected. There's an other option, which I will use for the other side. Select both recordings, then using the keyboard, press and hold the shift and plus keys. Note that the new average waveforms appear bolded. You can move them up and down using the arrow keys to separate it from the other recordings. In the recording panel, you will see in the comments that this recording is a sum of these two recordings and a number of sweeps totals the number of sweeps of the first and the second one. Notice that I have the stimulus information activated for my recordings. If you prefer to use this as well, you can activate it in the show menu by going to show recording label and clicking on the stimulus information. Some sites prefer to have the extra information while others do not need it. Once you finish with one type of recording, if you want to move to another type of recording, you can easily move the recordings from the acquisition page to another page by right clicking on the current page and selecting send all data on this page to page and choosing your destination page. In this case, I will move the data from the acquisition page to my click page. You can also use the set page button to do the same. Using the feature will move the recordings and all items on the page as you have arranged them and make it easier to build your report. When testing infants, it is not uncommon to test one ear first, going through all the frequencies, and then proceeding to the other ear. Using this feature, you can easily move the right ear recordings to their corresponding pages first, then switching to the left ear and sending the left ear recordings to the pages, you will have the recordings arranged with the right ear recordings on one side and the left ear recordings on the other side. This makes preparing and generating your report a smooth process. I will go ahead and show this when we do our first tone verse. Right now, I'll go ahead and click on load settings and choose my 4000 Hz tone burst setting. The stimulus is set to be presented continuously and so it is set by default to a low intensity. Some clinics start recording at 50 or 60 dB and others prefer to start at the estimated threshold. It is up to you. I will record a threshold here and so to set the intensity I double click on the intensity button and enter 20 then begin. After the acquisition has begun, the acquire button turns into a pause button that you can click to pause. You can also use a space bar on the keyboard to pause acquisition. Pausing the recording is useful if you need the patient to settle down once you are ready to proceed. You can click yes to continue. If you wanted to stop the recording altogether, you would select no. I'm going to repeat the recording since I see what seems like a clear response. On the right of the pause stop button is a restart button. This button will stop the current acquisition and restart the sweeps all in one click. It is particularly useful when testing babies as a quick way to restart the test if you have noisy recordings. When you have a recording selected and it is green, 
As you move along the recording, if you look on the top of the screen, you will be able to easily see where you are in time. I will label the peaks as we did before. While the recording is in progress, note that you can also adjust the placement of any peaks at any time. You simply need to click on the label. It will become red, and then you can move the latency and amplitude markers as needed. I will send the data from the right ear to the 4000 Hz page, and I will continue with the left ear, and while I'm recording, I'll go over some of the buttons on the toolbar. I will go from left to right, describing the function of each button. The left icon allows you to create a patient file and the button next to it to open an existing patient file. Next, you will find the peak labels that apply to the type of auditory evoke potential you are recording. Here, since we are in ABR mode, we have the labels for peaks 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. The next icons allow you to load a recording, save a single recording, or save multiple recordings. All recordings are automatically saved upon completion, but these buttons will allow you to manually save recordings that have been manipulated. Next, we have an option to toggle between a split page and a full page display. The next button allows you to apply a filter to the recording, for example, a smoothing filter. The I, O, and F button allow you to quickly arrange recordings by intensity, order of acquisition, or frequency, I, O, and F. Clicking on I will overlap recordings that have the same intensity. You can also use the buttons during and after acquisition. You can also arrange recordings by rate by typing the R key. The next button opens a latency intensity function which will automatically plot based on the recordings that have been labeled on your page. You can add notes to the page. For those of you who often fax records, we have a feature to increase the thickness of the waveform to make them more visible when they are printed. The last sets of buttons are used to save a report or load a previously saved report, as well as printing or generating a PDF of the report. Finally, you can clear recordings either from the page or from all pages. The I button takes you to our manual for more information. I will send the recordings for the left ear to the 4000 Hz page, and as I move to that page, notice that my recordings are arranged as they should be, even if they were sent at different times to the page. I will go ahead and record at 500 Hz, 1000 Hz, and 2000 Hz to allow you to review some of the commonly used features, such as how to start and stop recordings, how we label the recordings and move them. To start the test, click on Load Settings and choose the settings or parameters you want to use. Double-click on Intensity, set the level, and click on Acquire to start. To mark the peaks, first make sure the waveform you're trying to label is selected. The selected waveforms are green in color. To select the recording, you can either click on the circle on the left of the recording, or you can click on the recording itself, use the S key from the keyboard to cycle through recordings, or select recordings from the recording information panel. To label a recording, click on the label for the peak you are trying to mark, then click right above or below the waveform where you would like to place it. Once the peak label is placed, you will notice there are two triangles, one at the top facing down, and the other at the bottom facing up. The top marker is a latency marker and the bottom marker is the amplitude marker. You can adjust the position of either marker either by clicking and dragging the marker or using the keyboard. To move the latency marker, use the right and left arrow keys and to move the amplitude marker, use the right or left arrow keys while holding down the Alt key. You can click on the ear to change from left to right ear. To move the recordings from the acquisition page to another page, right-click on the current page and select Send All Data on this page to Page and choose your destination page.
Another way to label the recordings is to right click on the recordings themselves and select Mark Peak and choose the peak you wish to mark. Make sure you are at the location where you'd like to mark the peak before doing this. You can also right click on the recording and click Mark Other Peak, which will open up a window allowing you to choose from a variety of evoke potential labels. Uh, you can also create your own labels or a templates of labels. And now I'll send my 500 Hertz waves to the page that already had my right ear recordings and they will all be joined together on the same page. I am now ready to move on to 1000 Hertz. And so I will load up my settings file for 1000 Hertz and begin the acquisition. I set my intensity to 30 and click on acquire to start my 1000 Hertz recording. I'm now going to manually move the recording further up the page. You can still see the sweep count on the top left with the rejection count next to it. This count remains there regardless of the page you are on, which makes it easy to keep track of the acquisition while working on the other pages. You can zoom in using the plus button. You can label the recording by clicking on the peak label you want to place and placing it above or below the recording at the location you intend to place it. Now that I see a clear response, I will stop it and click on no to continue my acquisition and try to replicate. I'm selecting the recording to move it by clicking on the circle on the left of the recording and you'll note that the selected or active recording is green and the circle is filled. I can click and drag it up and down as you can see here. If I want to quickly arrange by intensity, I can either click on I or type the letter I on my keyboard. As I am recording on the acquisition page, I can move to another page to work on my recordings and prepare my reports. I clicked on I to arrange my 500 Hertz recordings by intensity, so they are all lined up together. Now that I'm back on the acquisition page to stop the test. And now I'll send the data for 1000 Hertz to the 1000 Hertz page. Here I'm loading my 2000 Hertz settings file, setting my intensity to 25 and acquire. While the 2000 Hertz recording is in progress, I will click on the 4000 Hertz page to go to that page so I can remove the test note I had added before. It gives me the opportunity to show you how to clear either a recording or a note from a page. Right click on the item you want to clear and click on clear to clear it from the page. Clearing a recording from the page will not delete it as you can always go back to load recordings. I am selecting the recording, now it's green, and looking at the recording information by clicking on the Rec Info button on the right, where you'll find easy access to more information on your recording, including the parameters used for acquisition, peak labels, recording data quality indicators, and more. Heading over to the Click page to show you how to compare two recordings. First, select one recording by clicking on its circle, hold down the control key, and select the other recording. Both circles are now filled. Now, go to the Compare tab of the Recording Information panel, and you will see displayed the interoral differences as well as the interpeak interoral differences. You can click on Add Info to Page to add the information to the page, and click and drag the Information Boxes circle to move it to your desired location on the page. Let's head back to the acquisition page to label the recordings. Now, the label could not be placed because the recording was not active, it was in green, since I did not select it. If you try to place a label on a recording that is not green, the label will not be placed on the recording. Once the recording is green, I can choose the marker and label the recording. Now I'll stop the recording and start one last one recording of 2000 Hertz. As a reminder, to adjust the peaks, click on the peak you want to adjust. It'll become red. To move the latency marker, use the left and right arrow keys on your keyboard. And for the amplitude marker, hold down the Alt key while clicking the left and right arrow keys. Clicking on I will sort by intensity, which will overlap the recording since they are both for the same intensity. Now, once I'm ready to stop the recording, I'll click on the pause stop button and say no to continue acquiring.
Now, I'll move the recordings from the acquisition page to the 2000 Hertz page. We have already covered many of the report generation features as we went through the acquisition, since many of them can be used while you're acquiring. I highlighted many features of our pages and how they help improve workflow by making it easier to organize our recordings as we acquire. One other feature that was implemented is the ability to set up page attributes for our pages and save them. This is useful if you use page labels, as you can save page attributes, including the time and amplitude scales, zoom size, and all the parameters you see when you right-click on page as part of your default or specific attributes. This will be useful when you click and manually move single recordings from one page to the next as the page attributes will already be set. This only needs to be set up once at setup. And if you're using our pediatric labels and attributes, you are all set. If you do not use the page attributes feature, then you will need to apply the page attributes to a page prior to manually moving data to a page. I mentioned earlier that you can add notes or text to the page by clicking on the notepad icon or by going to report, add text. You can also create text templates or modify one of our existing templates and add, which will speed up writing of the report. For those of you who use our OAE modules, you can also import the DPOAE and TEOAE results to one of the pages in SmartEP to have a more complete report. Before ending your session, even if you have not finalized your report, it is important to save your report. This will allow you to load up the report and all of your pages will populate as you had left them. You can continue working on them as well. To save a report, you can click on the Save Report icon or click on Report, Save Report. The report will already be saved in the patient record and so more commonly, our users use the date as the report name and save. To show how convenient it is to load a saved report, I will exit the software and relaunch. Now, I will load up my patient, then click on the load report icon. You can also go to report, load report for this, and select the report I saved a few minutes ago. Note that all of my pages are, are filled just as they were. This will save time, as you will not need to manually reload each recording when you're ready to print. You can continue working on the report, continue labeling, and resave under the same name or a different name. You can also clear all pages to start again another report from scratch. Now, when you're ready to print, I recommend printing a PDF preview or saving the report as a PDF file. I always like to do this so that I can see how the report will look before I print it. If you would like to change the logo and use your own logo on the report, please contact our technical support team and we'll be happy to guide you through the process. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch this training video. Please do not hesitate to contact us by calling our office or sending us an email. Our sales and support teams are available to assist you.